I'm Cody Skillen. My name is Bernhard. And we're here representing Winnipeg Nightly Arts at the Manitoba Highland Gathering 2020. So first we're going to go over the basics of footwork in our system. The footwork that we use is a alternating footwork system. So that means every time that we change which side of our body the sword is on, we change which foot is forward. So the way that we get into this stance is we start off with our feet shoulder width apart and then we move one foot back about half of a step. So it's about a heel toe kind of a relationship. Then we bend our knees so that way if we get pushed back we don't rock up onto our heels. And then from here, if my hilt is on the right side of my body, I'll have my right foot back. And then if I do a cut that transitions the side, then I'll step forward or back. It doesn't matter if you step forwards or backwards. The most important thing is that the side that your hilt is on is where your back foot is. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the four corners or the four peaks as they're generally known and the uh, guards and hanging. So the four corners are basically if you draw a line down the center of your body and you draw a line about around the line of uh, the height of the solar plexus. And the idea is that you can protect one of these corners, right, by, by being in this diagonal position with your guard. And what this does is it allows you to stop cuts that are coming generally from this angle, uh, usually from that side entirely, so that the opponent will have to attack to the other side, or they would have to commit to some action that somehow gets around my blade. If I show the four corners against Bernhardt, the first would be here, the upper right corner peak to the head, and then the lower corner would be here, right? The other corner would be here, and then the lower left peak is the final one. The reason that we use this uh, idea is because it allows us to defend an, an, a large portion of, of the body and by transitioning between them we can cover several areas relatively quickly. This is why feints are usually necessary in order to draw out a defense in one area so that you can attack the area that they were previously defending. Next we're going to cover basic cutting mechanics as well as the Vinden. So the way that this works is when you're doing anything with the sword, you are going to be pivoting around some point of the sword. So either the hand like this or the center of the blade like this. So this is the part that's remaining fixed or the point, right? So it would look like this or if my point's forward, it would look more like that. So the idea of using this type of uh, movement, right? Transitioning my hands from one of the diagonal corners to the other, right? Is called the Vinden. And we use this in situations uh, both in cutting and in the bind. The bind is when swords make contact with each other and usually you're fighting for control over the center line or the shortest line between the, you and your opponent. So the way that this works with cutting is we do the rotations around the hand. So if I'm going to cut, I will cut uh, first by pivoting around my hands, waiting for the point to go forward, and then stepping. That way it presents a threat to the opponent before I'm moving forward. So if their point's already forward, I'm not going to step onto it. The way that we do other cuts like this is for instance, I'll pivot my hands back, get into the corner I want to get into and rotate the point forward or go here and cut back into this corner. Or I can also cut like this, like this and like this as some examples. The most important thing is that you transition your hands from one corner or one hanging into another, such as this. So now I'm gonna talk about one of the most important concepts in swordsmanship, and that's the idea of strong and weak. So the way that this works is, if your opponent's sword is out, there are two portions of their blade, roughly speaking. So the weak is actually towards the point here, it's about this third. And the reason we call it the weak is if Bernhardt's resisting me, right? I can bend this really easily. But 
this part down here we would call the strong and the difference is if I like I'm gonna have to move pretty much his entire body or his entire body weight before I actually get the sword to move so in practice with a blade what you want to be doing is getting your strong onto the opponent's weak that way you can displace them and attack alternatively if we're both just using strong on strong and forcing against each other right from here I'm not going to be able to out muscle him by doing this alone but what I can do is use the force that he's putting in by getting him to overcommit in order to do attacks to the other side that's why almost all swordsmanship is seeking to get your strong on the opponent's weak or getting them to overcommit and attacking them around to the other side. So now we're going to go over some of the applications of the movements and ideas that we are talking about. One of the interesting things about swordsmanship is that it's really not very complicated, it's just difficult. The first one we're going to start to apply is cuts combined with the strong on weak principle. And the best example of this is done against uh, with a cut against what we call Longinort, or a uh, fully reaching thrust position. So, if Bernhard's like this, what I want to do is I want to cut and I want to displace his blade. So what I will do is I'm going to cut, I'm going to make contact with my strong onto his weak, press in, and then com complete it with a thrust. That thrust is known as the Zornhau Ort, or the point of wrath. So we're just going to do this a couple times. So the reason that this is so important is because it allows you to create an opening in your opponent's defense while they have their point forward, which is a very uh, dangerous position to try to attack normally because if you do nothing, right? So if I just try to cut straight to Bernhard's head, right? The point is gonna go directly into my face. Sure, I might hit him, but at this point he'd be jamming me back by my face. And a lot of the defense in this system is built around the concept of if you don't deal with your opponent's passive offense you are going to get thrust in the face or cut before you actually manage to strike your opponent. The core of good swordsmanship is about being able to attack your opponent without being hit. If you're both just going and trying to hit each other all that's going to happen is you're both going to hit each other and that's not skilled swordsmanship. So. The core concept is blending offense with defense in such a way that we can attack our opponent without being struck ourselves. So the next idea is using the Vinden movement as a counter offense. So if Bernhard is attacking me, I'm going to use that Vinden movement I showed earlier. I'm going to use this in order to apply a counter thrust to him, which we call an absetzen or a, a setting off. So. Right? The idea here is I'm winding my strong onto his weak, pressing in and thrusting to his face. So this can also be done against other attacks, such as a uh, thrust. So, right? Um, and also a uh, low over half. That would be the way that you would apply the Vinden in a more neutral situation. So, outside of the bind, in what we call the Zufechten. The Zufechten is the pre-fencing or the coming to the fencing. In a situation where you're in the bind, this is an equally useful movement. So, if we were to do any kind of a cut that makes blade on blade contact, such as this, right? From here, what I want to do is the same thing. I want to wind my strong onto his weak, and from here, begin applying pressure. Now, in reality, a lot of these things are not going to work like one off. What's going to happen is it's going to have to be a continuous string of offense and defense as we are uh, fencing. But it's useful to be able to practice the, the execution of an individual move against an opponent who is not fully resisting, but will 
stop you from executing the move if you are doing it wrong. Uh, by which I mean, if, I, if we were in a bind, right, and I was trying to wind and I was going like this, right, Bernhardt's putting enough pressure that I can feel it. But the second I start to get my strong on line and my point in, he's not choosing to do a different action. He's just forcing me to, to execute my technique properly. So, again, we have a situation where we end up in a bind and I can wind my strong onto his loop and then thrust him. Normally you would do this more fluidly. There are other variations that come from this uh, Vinden movement and the first one's called the Mutiren or uh, mutating. A mutating is used when your opponent might be trying to escape the bind or cut around or otherwise uh, pull back and just get out of the bind and it's kind of a preemptive action that you can use to to trap them in in the bind scenario so if we cut into the bind and Bernhardt starts moving in some way right what I will what I'm going to do right from here I wind like this and I can feel him start to move in some way right I'm going to press my point over his right and I want to get my point underneath his arm essentially, right? And that's it. And from here, right, I can go like this and I can wind even more if I want. But generally you want to end up in this kind of a position and then thrusting upwards. It particularly helps when the opponent's trying to go down or trying to go something like this, right? So from here, it begins to move and then I'll mutate from there. It can also be used directly from a cut. So, right? from here or again so in a situation where we end up in a bind and I wind against him and then he winds against me I would want to use a mutiren in order to force his point in order to regain control of his point so from here I go like this now Bernhardt will try to do the same thing to me and I go over like that and thrust low and what this is doing is it's stealing some of his uh, reach so if his point's up like this, he reaches like this. As I rotate it down, he has less reach. So that's what makes this technique work. The other key use of the Vinden is in what's called the Duplirin, or the doubling. It's called the doubling because it allows you to strike your opponent again. Uh, it gives you another opportunity to attack them when they start trying to displace you. So if we go into the bind again, right? And I start to wind against Bernhardt, and instead he's pushing me offline like this. What I can do is instead of continuing to fight this way, I don't want to go strength against his strength. Instead, I'm going to wind like this, and I'm going to cut him to the other side. Right? Mm -hmm. so. This kind of gets us into the topic of what to do when the opponent displaces. So when the opponent's displacing in a way where they leave their point mostly forward or they're trying to wind against you, you don't want to use the duplirin. Uh, that starts to get very dangerous because what will happen is I go like this, right? I wind like this, you wind against me, right? As I try to do this, he's going to thrust me directly in the face. So in that situation, you want to go back to using the first Vinden. So usually the Duplirin, in my experience, is followed up almost instantly by a, another Vinden against their blade in order to kind of protect yourself from one of the follow-up actions. So... So as you can see, the Duplirin and the Mutirin kind of work together in a way that like lets you work your opponent's blade consistently where you want it and allows you to apply pressure. So there's another form of displacement where the opponent displaces you really hard to the side. They really want to shove you out of the way, right? So if I cut like this and from here begin winding like this and Bernhardt puts a lot of pressure sideways. From here, I'm not gonna be able to do a Duperin. The key reason is because his point, his point of contact is so far out here that I have to go like that which is just too big of a move it's not practical in swordsmanship however making this movement allows me to do something else i can just pop pop my sword back 
as I'm making this movement and then cut to Bernhardt. So again, it would look something like this. Right? Usually it feels as though you're doing the Duplirin movement, but your opponent's blade just slips off and you just direct your point back to the opponent's face. So, once again. There's one other form of uh, way to counter an opponent displacing, and this is when they tend to displace you down really, really hard. It's called the... Uh, there we go. So, in this situation, we get into the bind, I wind up, and from here, he starts to press me down. What I want to do is pull back and thrust directly to his face. The reason that this works is because while we're here, if I'm going like this, my hands are already high, he's pull, pushing down on my point and usually going wide. This is what makes it key, is like the amount of force that he's using is driving down really low. And from here, it gives me this, a much smaller, faster movement. So in this case, we're using a combination of distance and timing in order to create an o a safe opening to attack our opponent. This, this counter usually requires uh, a good sense of timing though, because it is mostly using time to defend yourself. So you have to be able to execute it in a very, very tight, uh, tight uh, time frame. One other thing which I find is very useful in understanding uh, Longsword fencing in general, not just the German style, but the Italian style as well, and how the two interact, is a cut that's called the uh, Krumpau. So the way that this works is it's a cut that goes like this, right? It's almost like a windshield wiper motion. And the idea is that you're going to displace the opponent's cut. As they cut in, you displace. So uh, we'll try to get... As Bernhard cuts to me, I would displace like this and then threaten him with the back edge, right? So, right? And you can also catch their, their blade uh, on your guard. So the reason that this is important is because this is how most people are going to apply that very hard pressure off to the side usually. And you'll see a lot of times people will follow it up with a cut around. So what ends up happening is it's Strong displacing pressure followed up by a cut around. So, right? Or alternatively, right? Or. There's all kinds of variations, but that's one of the moments where being able to cut around with a tsukin um, or force the opponent to stay into the bind is incredibly important. And that's where a lot of focus goes in the training. That's a general overview of most of the core techniques and scenarios that you run into with specifically uh, longsword fencing. Also, the way that the German system tends to approach these situations and the philosophy that we use in order to work through them and how we think about countering our opponent's actions and applying pressure. If you'd like to see more from us, you can check out our website at winnipegnightlyarts.com and you can come out and see us in the Manitoba Highland Gathering 2021.